The member from Oshawa. Thank you very much. And speaker, I'm very glad to have an opportunity to stand on behalf of the people from Oshawa and broadly Durham Region to talk about health care today. We're debating Bill 60, which is an act to amend and enact various acts with respect to the health system. Um, the short version of it is that this is, this is an attack on Medicare, and I am a Medicare defender, and I, I am Canadian, and I recognize the value of health care access for everyone and publicly funded health care, but importantly, and what we don't hear from this government, we don't hear from the Liberals, publicly delivered health care. Right. So I'm going to explain um, a fair bit for the folks at home, but also for this government, um, because the government has its talking points, and they seem to be confused when the members of the opposition are raising important concerns. And I'm going to continue to do that, and I hope that uh, I hope we're going to have a spirited discussion this afternoon. Tommy Douglas is known as the father of Medicare, among other things, frankly. But one of his quotes, and we've heard a lot of them lately, but one of his is, quote, We are all in this world together, and the only test of our character that matters is how we look after the least fortunate among us. How we look after each other, not how we look after ourselves. That's all that really matters, I think. And that's from Tommy Douglas. And we hear a lot in this space, especially in the government, there's a lot being done for folks that they know, maybe folks they play golf with, I'm not sure, but folks that stand to make a lot of money, and this government makes a lot of decisions that benefit them. And I can't speak to the why. I can't speak to the relationships. It's, you know, it, it, it doesn't look good, doesn't smell good, but that's where it stands, that a lot of the decisions that are made are not benefiting the, the vast majority of Ontarians, the average folk you know, the, our, our friends and neighbours, people we haven't met yet. Imagine putting forward legislation that actually benefited people that they didn't know. That's, that's how Ontario used to operate, but here we are. Another quote from Tommy Douglas about Medicare. He said, quote, I came to believe that health services ought not to have a price tag on them and that people should be able to get whatever health services they required, irrespective of their individual capacity to pay. So, again, Having access to health care based on need, not the ability to pay. And that's something that um, you know, we've heard from, from folks across the community writing in to us. Um, the government hasn't admitted it, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that they've also been hearing from folks saying, Medicare is what makes us Canadian. That's part of who we are. That's part of our identity. It's part of how the world sees us. Right. And so a bill like this that is, is just that you know, chipping away at the system, which is undermining the integrity of Medicare will lead to more degradation and will lead ultimately, potentially, you know, to a lot of people being sick, harmed, or worse. So the government is going to stand, and I, I can feel it coming, that they're going to call me a fear monger. But what I am is a, is a Medicare defender. What I am is a champion for the folks who write to my office that say, I already can't afford these random fees that I've got from my, my you know, private clinic, or that there's a, a blood test that they weren't told now requires a fee, which that's not legal. We're working with them. But I mean, this is already happening. Now imagine with this bill mm -hmm. that has the private surgical clinics that are not going to have the oversight that they need. More on that later. So, Speaker. We have a lot of folks uh, writing in. I've got one here from someone named Crystal. Crystal says, my name is Crystal, and I am writing you because fearing for our city, our province, and our country. This week, I waited eight-plus hours in Oshawa Emergency Department for my seven-year-old son to see a doctor. There's currently an 18-month wait to see a therapist, psychiatrist covered by OHIP in Ontario. Real people will die. This is unacceptable and too long in either regard. I urge you to please do whatever's in your power to request more funding for our health care. I fear our health care system is beyond repair. However, I can't stand idle while it crumbles. And that's from Crystal. And folks are worried and they don't know where to turn. So they, they reach out to us and they say, please stop this. Please help us. This is a, we're get, we've heard the term manufactured crisis. And I'm going to use it again because, uh, you know, this is, um, this is from an article, the, the uh, Financial Accountability Office. Uh, of Ontario had found 
has found that Ontario's per capita funding is the lowest in the country. Okay. So the report found that on the whole, Ontario's total program spending in 2020 was the lowest in Canada. And then, quote, since 2008, when the data is first available, Ontario has consistently had among the lowest levels of per person health spending in the country. And there are reasons for that. There's all sorts of stuff. But this government has not changed that course, right? And if you're starving a system, chances are it's going to be hungry. And if you're starving a system, chances are a lot of people aren't going to be able to get what they need. And if you starve a system, you're manufacturing a crisis. We had an opposition day motion how many hours ago today? And the short version of that speaker, I know that folks already heard that debate, they were saying, let's utilize the resources that the taxpayers have already invested in. Let's utilize these surgical suites that already exist, the operating rooms that are already ready to go with city-of-the-art um, technologies and whatever they need that provide surgeries, that do the, the work, that do the surgeries, the staff do them, excuse me, in these operating rooms. But then around, as we heard our health critics say, around February, March, when the money runs out, when the government cap on you're only allowed to do this many surgeries, you're only allowed to do this many of cataracts or of hip replacement, and once that they have done that, there's no more funding. So those operating rooms sit sit vacant. And some of the members on the other side are kind of like furrowing their brow like, that can't be right. Well, ask your government because it is. And the member from Nickel Belt and the member from Temiskim and Cochrane, they talked eloquently about exactly how many operating rooms there are and how many basically have to go offline, not because people don't need surgeries. So we said, let's use those resources before you guys you know, are, are making all these deals for the private clinics. It's like you don't make eye contact over that, like, oh, we've got resources and we're not investing and we can't use what we've got. Uh, but I promised Frank at golf on Saturday that we'd help him build his clinic. Okay, I can't, I, Speaker, I withdraw. I don't know that that happened. But you can't say that. True, I can't say that, but I can wonder. I can wonder. Um, so I'm, I'm going to continue along the, uh, the lines here of the manufactured crisis. Bill 124, and, and folks maybe who are just tuning in now and are like, what is this Bill 124 I've heard of? Well, specific to health care, and I mean, we could talk about all sorts of other sectors in Bill 124, ferry workers, for example, um, but the nurses. The nurses are not able to be paid what they're worth by where they work at the hospital. Okay, so this is just a piece of it. When I had met with folks at the hospital, um, Lake Ridge, they're basically being held hostage. Okay, they would they would normally, without Bill 124, with this like foot on their head that they aren't allowed to bargain fair wages, would normally bargain a wage for their their staff. Okay, whatever that is that is fair. But they're not allowed. There's a cap on that. So instead, they're forced to pay less than 1% increases. And then there's the private agency world over here. The private agency world over here doesn't have that foot on their head, doesn't have that cap on wages. So they can pay more. So a nurse might have to make that tough decision to walk away from benefits and a, a union protections because there's so much money to be made over here and that they leave, and they've been leaving in droves. And the hospitals don't have anyone to reach for. There's no staffing because now they're working at agencies, but they still require staff because you, me, and your neighbors, everybody's sitting in emergency, sitting in waiting rooms needing, needing help. So they have, they're forced to go to the agencies who can charge them whatever. The nurses are making more, and I, begrudge, I don't begrudge them making more, but I do begrudge the agencies and their profit margins. Yep. yep. And they're fleecing our hospitals. And the hospitals, weirdly, weirdly, that have to answer to the government are allowed to pay those staffing costs. But they're not allowed to pay their own nurses. And the government is like, shh, stop talking. We don't want to hear this, right? Because that's business. That's options. That's, I don't know, whatever. Innovation. Innovation. <laughs> so I'm going to read something here, a letter from um, nurses who are quite concerned. And they have said, quote, expanding private Health care and forcing seniors into long-term care homes are false solutions. They won't address real problems. Ontario's nurse and health care staffing crisis. 
Thousands of job vacancies remain unfilled because there aren't enough skilled nurses available and willing to do the work under unfair working conditions. Unprecedented backlogs of surgeries and other procedures can't be cleared without proper investment in publicly delivered health care. People with urgent care needs are waiting longer than ever, with some outstretched emergency rooms having to close their doors and send patients elsewhere. These challenges are the result of underfunding and unfair legislation like Bill 124 making it harder than ever for our public health care system to retain and recruit nurses and health care professionals. This, this situation isn't sustainable, and it goes on. Bill 124, the court said, was unconstitutional and this government's fighting them, but we've heard today, well, we are not allowed to discuss it because it's before the courts. But anyway, but this speaks to the government's priorities. You know, don't do right by the nurses. Don't do right by the health care workers. Don't fix the staffing problem. Don't address the backlogs when we have empty operating rooms because the, the hospitals aren't allowed to ask for more money for certain types of surgeries because there's a cap. All right, like all of this is, this is manufactured. Speaker, the Ontario Health Coalition has been doing fantastic work and they've been doing town halls across our community, and I was proud to, um, you know, to join in on one of the Zoom town halls to hear from people about what their concerns are, what their fears are, but also what their plans are. So I'm, I'm proud to be a Medicare defender, I'll say it. Um, speaker, there were also Liberals on some of those calls, which I thought was fun. And I say kind of fun because they, everybody's talking about publicly funded health care. Even this government talks about publicly funded health care. Well, I'm not challenging publicly funded health care. Your tax dollars, my tax dollars, folks pay into the system, right? Health care is supposed to be one of the things that comes out of it. So publicly funded health care, the money goes into the health care bucket. Picture a big bucket. That's where our health care dollars go. My concern is about publicly delivered. Because if you've got this big bucket of money that's meant to go to health care, and then you've got all these for-profit companies that come along and say, ooh, I can do it better, faster, cheaper. No, they can't. In fact, <laughs> the, the evidence is that they can't. But right now, they say they can. So these private companies come along, and they drill holes in that bucket, and that money goes to profit margins, goes to shareholders. So the money doesn't go as far because that level goes down and down when it goes to profit instead of being reinvested in the system. So publicly delivered, those holes don't exist because we don't have to pay profit margins. It's patient care instead of profit margin. So that's the difference between publicly funded and publicly delivered. And the, new, like the official opposition, New Democrats, understand that. The Ontario Health Coalition and Medicare champions across this province understand that. And for the government that jumps up and down and says, you will never have to pay with your credit card, and how dare you suggest such a thing? Fees? You're going to have to pay with your credit card, and you're not actually arguing that. So but you're talking about health care services. It'll never have to be paid for with a credit card. It can always be paid for with the OHIP card. Okay, fine. But your OHIP card? Ain't going to go as far with all that money leaking out of your profit bucket. That's true. So how you pay for it is part of the conversation. How far that money goes and making decisions in the best interest of public health and care, that's the conversation I wish this government was capable of having. Why not? Speaker. I have a stack of letters, and I am running out of time. But um, I, and I would actually, I'd invite folks to go online. And I know a lot of the government members, you know, are googling the the facts of the world uh, the last couple of days. So the Ontario Health Coalition has a whole bunch of fact sheets, okay, about the Canada Health Act, about uh, facts about two-tiered Medicare, a lot of the myths that are out there, right? So take a look, um, do some homework, learn a couple things. Um, but I have a letter here that was sent in the mail from Judy in Oshawa, and I want to read this. She says, quote, 
It's easy to make privatization look appealing. There would be promises of low premiums from the insurance companies in the beginning, but eventually rates would explode like they have in the U.S. Uh, there are many people, there are people there paying thousands of dollars per month for health care. How many of us make thousands of dollars a month that they could pay towards health care? And let's be honest, private health care doesn't really want to pay out, especially on anything major. Their goal is to not pay out, like all insurance companies. She goes on and on. And she says, health care is expensive, but privatizing it would make it more expensive for individuals because of uncontrollable corporate greed. A proper government should be acting on behalf of the public, the individuals who live and work in this province, not the rich and often multinational corporations that Premier Ford appears to work for. Judy also uh, remembers. She says, our health care is something I remember my parents being so proud of. Universal health care came about when I was a young child. It sets Canada apart from many nations. We used to be a shining example that other nations look to with envy. She talks about what they see in the States. People can lose their homes more if they have a very serious medical issue. Many die. It's a system that discriminates against anyone who is not rich. We should never allow this to happen here. Thank you, Judy. Um, and Speaker, the government's going to get up and, and say, well, that's not happening. And I will say, yet. Because Bill 60, this is a dark day in Ontario, no matter what they tell you at the caucus table, government, this is a dark day. Because there isn't coming, you're not going to be able to come back from this easily. Once you've got the sharks in there, right, once you've got the profit yep. margins, once you've got all of that profitization of health care, they ain't giving that back. Let's look at long-term care. An Orchard Villa in, in my neck of the woods, mm -hmm. in Durham region, mm -hmm. instead of holding them to account, instead of, at the time, shutting them down, instead of you know, saying that that was not okay that those people died, this government rallied so fast to protect them from being sued. And now we wait with bated breath. Will they or won't they get their 30-year license extension and additional beds? That's what you do. That's what this government has done when it comes to profit and for-profit companies with, a, with their death grip on our health care system, and in that case, long-term care. Speaker, I have so many letters. Here's one. Kelly said, I'm writing with a truly burdened heart over the status of the health care system in both Ontario and Canada. The provincial and federal governments must do more to address the crisis in our hospitals. I wish that I could come up with the words to articulate how difficult this last week has been. She wrote about her father, who was sent by ambulance to the hospital with a suspected stroke. And of course, time is of the essence in that case. She said, my father spent seven hours on a hard chair in the emergency ward and was sent home with the message he had, had not had a stroke. There was no treatment. However, it was later confirmed by his eye doctor that he had indeed had a TIA. And she says, it is truly incredibly scary that in an emergency, our health care system is not equipped to respond in a timely or thorough manner. I know that there is a crisis in the system. There is no excuse for not being able to provide proper emergency care where lives depend on it. Please do your part to advocate to the provincial government that there must be more done. This is Ontario and this is Canada. Speaker. Um, there's a lot at stake right now. Yeah. Bill 60 is a terrible mistake. It is unnecessary. Our opposition day motion earlier made the case, and it is a legit case, and you know it, that there are resources that we are not using, that we have operating rooms that could be utilized to clear the backlog, but you won't fund the staffing. That we have a staffing crisis and shortage and you won't allow hospitals to pay their staff what they're worth. Won't allow. We're talking about Medicare. And people who are writing in about the fees that they're having to pay, we're just going to see more of that. And in this bill, there isn't sufficient oversight, and anyone who says there is cannot point to it in this bill. When it comes to oversight, it should be rigorous. Anything you do with health care should be about patient protection. Yeah. There is not anything in this bill about oversight. If you're going to move it into a for-profit, investor-driven corporate clinic, 
You're taking it out from under the CPSO because it's no longer under a physician that these surgeries will be done. It'll be done under a company, and the CPSO no longer has uh, oversight. Well, then what? Because patient complaints, you want to spend some time talking about that? Your patient complaint system is insufficient today before we do this. You are doing the wrong thing, yep. and Ontarians, Ontarians deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Go from Niagara West. Well, my thanks to the member for Oshawa for participating in debate this afternoon and for contributing uh, her comments and remarks uh, about the legislation. I, I think we have uh, deep differences of perspective on how this bill will impact the people of Ontario. I believe very firmly that uh, the legislation before this House is going to have an immense impact in a positive way by reducing the wait times and ensuring that people in my riding are able to access the care that they expect and deserve when and where they need it. But my question to the federal, uh, sorry, to the member opposite is, I know she obviously supports uh, the work that her former colleague, Mr. Jagmeet Singh, is doing in Ottawa, and I'm just wondering if she would support, uh, if she were a federal MP, the federal expansion of dental health benefits, and if she supports the federal expansion of dental Dental health benefits. Does she support the fact that that will be provided through private dentists? Thank you. Response. Okay. Um, so, a couple of things. I am very proud to stand in this house as a New Democrat and as a provincial member who is excited about having the opportunity to stand um, on behalf of people when it comes to public education public health care. I want to strengthen the system we have before us. Tommy Douglas, his vision was also about pharmacare and dental care. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. It's supposed to be about wellness, right? And the idea of prevention and trying to keep people well before they got sick. I mean, economically speaking, that should make sense to conservatives, but from a, a human perspective, health and wellness should be based on need not people's ability to pay, which is why we're standing here Bonds. talking about the importance of protecting Medicare from this piece of legislation, and, and I'm, I'm proud to do that work every day. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, just last week I had a town hall uh, in Niagara Falls, and we had over 200 people there. It was a full house. Uh, they were very passionate about protecting our publicly funded, publicly delivered health care. We had the Health Coalition was there, who we've all know and have talked about in this house. We had an ER doctor. We had mental health organizations, paramedics, who are saying that they're stuck at hospitals. Um, so I believe that Ontarians are going to fight uh, tooth and nail to protect their publicly funded health care system. But my question is, it's interesting today, because it's the first time I've heard it, is that the last three years we've been raising Bill 124 in this house, and today, they're now saying it's before the courts. We can't Question. comment. I just want to ask my colleague, why do you think they're saying that? Response? I wouldn't even know where to begin with the why. But I think if I... Oh, I can't even pretend that I'd be part of that government. Um, okay, I... It should be a conversation that we're all having around the priorities of this government. Bill 124 has these tentacles that reach out in, across industry and across jurisdictions. Um, we're talking about health care today. We're talking about nurses. I, I cannot pretend to know what motivates this government, um, but it isn't doing right by health care workers, and it isn't uh, doing right by seniors and ailing Ontarians. It isn't uh, about prevention. Um, it isn't about ensuring that people have access to um, the benefit of properly funded health care system when they need it. Um, so if it's none of those things, I will let them speak for themselves as to what motivates them. Questions? Adam Kent, Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. As I mentioned earlier, one key component to ensuring the right care in the right place is expanding care at local pharmacies. As of last week, 70,000 assessments were conducted by pharmacists, highly trained, trusted, regulated health professionals across the province. 
Will the member opposite support expanding the scope of pharmacists so that constituents in Oshawa and Reddings across Ontario can get better access to care closer to home? Response. Um, I'd love to know which part of the bill um, that's part of, but anyway, um, what I will say is that our communities have complex needs, and so the fact that folks can go to the pharmacists who are professionals and, and are able to um, deliver important pieces of that care, um, everyone across communities is, is glad for that. Now, is who benefits from that beyond the patients and actual you know, folks in the community? I get I get pretty sticky when it starts to be Mr. Galen Weston over and over and yeah. over, right? Like I want healthcare to be about healthcare and about caring about health, not just about making folks stupid rich, right? So I, I think when we are focused on patient care, Response. we're going to be doing the right thing, or I guess the left thing. When we're focused on profit care, I got a problem with that. Questions? Member from London North Centre. I'd like to thank my colleague from Oshawa for her wonderful presentation. I want to take you back to March of 2022 when Ontario's former patient ombudsman and at that time the Conservative Health Minister Christine Elliott almost issued a warning or, or at the very least let it slip. She stated, we are making sure that we can let independent health facilities operate private hospitals. And possibly when they realized how foolish and how wrong this was, the minister spoke spokespeople said of privatization, the use or function of private hospitals and independent health facilities in Ontario is not being expanded or changed. Clearly funding is being cut from publicly delivered health care as a result of, as we've seen in the FAO's report, cutting $5 billion, and it's being question. put into for-profit uh, health care profiteers' pockets. Uh, my question is to the member, why did they flip-flop? Response. Stop asking me about their motivations. I don't know. I've never been a conservative, and I never will be. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to do the opposite of that. I'm going to talk about why we should not privatize uh, public hospital services, um, whatever that looks like, whatever they call it. Um, them or the next. Well, won't be the next. The next government will make the best decisions for Ontarians and their health. So why we shouldn't uh, privatize public hospital services from the Ontario Health Coalition, um, they provide for-profit clinics and hospitals provide poor quality care. They hire less qualified staff and direct public funds into profits rather than care, as we've talked about. It worsens staffing shortages. Uh, private clinics take easier and less complex patients, leaving the more complex folks um, languishing. Um, and they also charge user fees and extra bill patients on top of OHIP for uh, medically necessary services. This is not the direction Ontario should be going. Um, reverse course, please. Quick question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. My question to the member opposite is this. We've heard a lot about Tommy Douglas today and the great work he did in getting the Medical um, Care Act passed in 1966. And I'm sure my uh, friends opposite know that there's four core principles to that policy before the federal government will entertain any health care transfer. And those four principles are public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, and portability. We know that this government spent $78 billion last year on health care, which was a $14 billion increase from the year before. We also know that in recent discussions with the federal government, they've increased that funding over the next 10 years by $8.4 billion. Will the member opposite agree that the federal government would have ceased the transfers if we were privatizing health care in yes, Canada? Sir. Will you admit that this privatization is just a smokescreen that you are proposing to try and somehow discredit the much needed changes this government Thank has made? You. Sorry, is the pri so the last part is the privatization my smokescreen for the good stuff the government's doing? Oh, that I would have that kind of power. Um, listen, privatization or profitization or whatever word this government's going to be comfortable with is the wrong direction. So when it comes to the the you know lowest per capita funding that we've got in Ontario, 
There, to the member's question, there are multiple layers to why, but this government is not making it better. This government has not been investing what it needs to in health care. The manufactured crisis, that is your smokescreen. That is this government's, you know, hey, look over here, look how bad things are. We're going to have to rescue it with this absurd scheme that has been tried time and time again and Tons. does not bear fruit. In fact, it will make sure that Ontarians don't have what they need when they need it. Um, that is the wrong the wrong way to head. This should not be a plan for just the wealthy. This Thank should you. be a plan to further debate.